Hello and welcome to this webinar. Last month we looked at what does it mean to know a word and so sort of carrying on with the theme a bit I thought this month we'd do we'd look at some thoughts on teaching vocabulary and what it means to do that. So before we start I think it's worth looking at what kind of factors affect vocabulary development. What different things do you think are important. Just stop a minute and jot down a couple of things that you think make a difference to individuals. Okay, I've got a few. Here's the first one. It depends a bit how old you are. Now clearly I'm painting with a broad brush here. Not all young people learn better than all old people but generally speaking it's easier for younger people to remember stuff than when you get a bit older. Um, I speak with, you know, some bitterness in my voice when I say I don't remember stuff as well as I used to. Um, and certainly, although I've spent a lot of my professional life avoiding teaching children, on the occasions when I have, I've been really amazed by how they just seem to soak sponge-like uh, up the um, vocabulary that, that we learn. So it is, I think, generally speaking, easier for younger people to remember stuff. Although, you know, there are other factors, of course, as well. Personality. Now, that's an interesting one. Um, I think it is easier for some people, depending on perhaps as much how they use language. If you're somebody who uses language a lot in your first language, if you talk a lot, if you enjoy communicating, the chances are that you'll learn a new language better and that you'll probably remember new vocabulary better. So there are some aspects of personality that are involved too. This is a huge one, of course. Um, if you are motivated, you will learn more quickly. Um, whether your motivation is internal, whether it's something because you really want to learn this new language, whether you want to remember these new words, or whether it's external, you've got an exam to pass, for example. Um, both of these things can have an effect, So, but motivation clearly is hugely important. Whether we like it or not, some people are just better at learning languages than others. Um, and this is a kind of innate thing. It doesn't mean that anybody can't learn a language, but you know, some people are better at playing football than others, and some people are better at playing an instrument than others, and some people are better at maths than others, and some people are better at learning languages than others and remembering vocabulary. So that will have an impact. And of course, how much you know before. If you've got a lot of, you know, if you've already learnt a fair bit, then probably you've got schema to attach new information to. So in honesty, it is easier, than probably, in some ways, the further you go on. Now, all of those factors that we've talked about, of course, are fairly fixed. But there are other things that are within our control. So, you know, personality, age, prior knowledge, those things you can't change so much. But there are other things that affect vocabulary development that we can change. So let's have a look at those. This is a big one, of course, is the context in which you work. I mean, arguably, there's uh, some limitations to how much you can change that, but you can certainly change how your classroom looks and feels and that kind of thing. So that is um, instrumental. the sort of tasks that you give them. We hope that uh, what we teach them has some impact. Um, so the kind of tasks that you give can help to develop vocabulary better, hopefully. That's, uh, I guess our whole job depends on that premise, but I think that it is true. Another thing, of course, that's important is, is how learners know how to learn. Um, and how they learn how to learn vocabulary in particular, since that's what we're talking about at the moment. So learn strategies and developing those strategies in learners. Some learners you'll find will already have very well developed learning strategies, 
but some won't and you'll be able to help in this aspect so that's another important thing and these kind of things clearly we can change we can have an influence on these kind of things so those are worth thinking about so when you're teaching vocabulary how can you best teach it how can you enable them to best learn it and the things that you can influence Moving on a bit, let's have a little look at a, a tiny bit of theory. I don't want to get too theoretical here. I think practical things are probably more important for, for the people who are listening. But, but let's have a little look at this because it is interesting. How many times do you think that we have to meet a word to remember it? Because, of course, this is crucial. It's not about just meeting a word. It's not about just learning it the first time. It's about being able to use it and remembering it in the future. What do you think? Any ideas? Often the figure that's banded about is seven, but I suspect that's because seven is a kind of a bit of a magic number. If you look at the research, Paul Nation's research, he suggests five to 16 exposures are necessary. Paul Mira's got a considerably higher estimate of 100 exposures. But I think that it's very difficult, really, to put a figure on this because apart from anything else, it will depend a lot on how conspicuous the word is in the text, how many contextual clues there are for you to learn it. If it's a word that's really going to be important to you, if you're passionate about surfing, for example, learning the word surf and surfboard and wave you're probably only going to have to see them once or twice and you'll remember them because you'll want to remember them. They'll be important for you. So, whereas, you know, something like, I don't know, lawnmower may have little influence on your life or, you know, little relevance in your life. And, um, you know, therefore it's going to take you probably many times of seeing that word before you remember it. So, it's not quite as easy as how many times do you have to see it. But I think that what is important to remember is that if you see a word only once, it's pretty unlikely that you'll remember it, that we do require more than one exposure. That's something I suppose that's worth taking from, from this. The other thing to think about is that if you are an, if you're learning your L1, you get a huge amount of exposure to language and to vocabulary in all sorts of contexts, from parents or carers, in schools, with your peers. You get an enormous amount of exposure, constant exposure to different vocabulary. And so, you know, you do hear a lot. If you're um, an L2 learner, if you're learning English as a second language or any other second language, then clearly you just don't get that much exposure. If you're living in the country, if you're learning as a second language, so if you're you know, um, a migrant to England, for example, then clearly you are going to get a fair amount of exposure. But the case for most people who are learning English is that they're learning in their home countries and their exposure is pretty limited to the classroom, a few hours a week possibly, um, possibly reading outside, possibly film, um, you know, possibly talking to some other people outside, but that's a real possible, um, not a probable, I guess. Um, so this is something, again, that's worth thinking about, is that the more that you can ask your learners, motivate your learners, to get extra exposure outside of the classroom through the internet. The internet is so brilliant, there's so much out there. Um, through reading newspapers, authentic texts, graded readers, it doesn't have to be authentic texts, it could be texts which are easier. Um, you know, listening to film, watching YouTube videos, whatever it is. But the more exposure that they can get, even if they're not explicitly learning something at that time, the fact is they'll have more exposure to, to that language and the chances are that they will remember more as, you, as they go along. The other thing that it's worth thinking about with this is 
how much you notice vocabulary. Um, so Paul Schmidt talks about noticing, he's the one who first brought that into the arena if you like, um, and this was when he was learning um, Brazilian Portuguese and he kept a notebook of his progress and what he noticed um, was that you need to notice things before you remember them. So I'm sure you've all had this experience. You've learnt a new word in your L1, in your first language you've learnt a new word or you heard a word for the first time and you think, God, I've never heard that before. And within a week you've heard it another once or twice. Now that's not because it wasn't out there before, it's just because you didn't notice it before. And so I think for a lot, and this is, doesn't only work for vocabulary, but also for grammatical structures as well, is that it's important to draw learners' attention to things. And if you draw at their attention to them and put a bit of focus on them, then the chances are that they might notice them the next time they come across them. So with the sort of noticing, the drawing attention to, plus exposure, further exposure, then hopefully they'll come across the same things again and that will um, you know, work to their benefit. How about dictionaries? I mean, clearly if we're talking about vocabulary, then dictionaries are important to think about as well. Um, there are different kinds of dictionaries, of course. Uh, there are your very small bilingual word-for-word -word translation kind of dictionaries. Learners tend to often really like these because they're small and they fit in a pocket and they're easy to use because they give me a direct translation to my language. They're not unuseful, of course they're helpful, but what learners have to be made aware of is that they can be misleading, that they're all right for, generally, all right for receptive purposes, but if you want to be able to use that word then it probably, those small dictionaries probably don't give you enough information about the word to use it productively. So they're okay for receptive, you want to understand what the word means, that's probably fine. But if you want to be able to use it, you may need more information. Monolingual dictionaries, where you've got you know, English to English, things like the Macmillan um, English Dictionary, which is an excellent one, the Longman, um, learner's dictionary I really like as well. So you know there are a few co-build ones also good. So these learner dictionaries they're good because they give you a lot more information about the word. They give you example sentences, they tell you what kind of word it is, they tell you it's transitive, intransitive, whether it's countable, incountable, all the uncountable, this sort of thing. So you've got a lot more information and so particularly the example sentences and the different uses. So those sort of things are very helpful um, in some languages you get both combined. This tends to be in the languages which are very widely spoken, Arabic, Spanish for example, um, Arabic or Spanish I mean, not Arabic, Spanish, um, where you have a translation from say, English to let's say Arabic, but you also have English um, information there, the kind of information you'd have in a monolingual dictionary about use of language. So I think those to me are the, you know, the ultimate, those are the most useful. Um, you might get some of that information in some of the good um, electronic dictionaries as well. The different difficulty with an electronic dictionary as far as as a teacher is concerned is you're not sure whether that electronic box equates to your little bilingual dictionary, which it might, or to you know the best kind of monolingual and bilingual dictionaries that we've just been talking about. It could be either, but you don't really know unless you actually have a look at what's being produced from the you know on the screen. Um, so those things are worth thinking about and worth talking about learn worth worth talking to learners about as well, I think. Um, other things, research shows that repeating aloud helps retention. So, you know, if you've got dual processing there, processing with the oral uh, senses and written sense, and again, you know, not just listening, but seeing the word. Me personally, I'm very visual. I cannot remember anything unless I've seen it. So dual processing there, both um, inputs, if you like, will help. 
then there are things about mnemonics and word associations. You know, if you remember the word, the word in Swahili, for example, is for welcome, is caribou. Well, it sounds like the animal, caribou. This is good in that it helps you perhaps remember, you can remember this funny animal coming to your door and that'll help you to remember that it means welcome. However, there are some problems potentially with that in that often the pronunciation is then skewed. So in Swahili it's karibu, the stress is on the second syllable there, whereas the animal is a caribou. It's the stress is on the first syllable and the a final ooh it is a, has a different quality. So whilst these things can be very helpful, especially at lower levels, to help learners grapple onto the first few words, the difficulties can be in that they will end up skewing the pronunciation. So be aware, beware of those things. Any other strategies that you can think of that you encourage? Let's stop you for a minute and have a think if there's anything else. So when we're thinking about teaching vocabulary, um, we've looked at various bits and pieces, but one of the things that's worth thinking about is that words taught in lexical sets may stick better together. Um, they may, I say may, you know, it's always a may with this kind of thing. You may not, um, but with some words, generally speaking, learning, you know, words for pots and pans and dishes and sauces and things like that, for example, together may help. Um, this obviously has you know, quite a ramification for, for teaching, you know, it's worth teaching in thematic groups. One thing I would say is worth remembering is that if you have words which sound similar, it may be a good idea not to teach them together. For example, uh, again learning Swahili, I learnt the word for shoes, um, via, uh, viazi, uh, viatu, and the word for potatoes, viazi, at the same time. Coincidentally, I learnt them around the same time. As you can see, they sound very similar, and as you can see, I, I still get them confused. I know which one's which, but I have to really think about it. So be aware, this is particularly something to think about when teaching, for example, phrasal verbs. You know, if you teach, you know, get in, get on, get under, get over, together, it may be quite, those things have very different meanings, but they sound very similar. So it may be quite difficult for learners to remember which one was which. So as I say, lexical sets tend to work quite well together. And we've talked about quiz and air rods before, but uh, I'm going to get them out again. Here's uh, my set of quiz and air rods. These, if you haven't seen them before, are used um, or were originally designed for use with maths. So they're different lengths of plastic or wooden rods, 10 centimetres, 9, 8, 7, 6, down to 1. But they're quite a nice visual aid. So um, in terms of teaching lexical sets, for example, I might be teaching about crime. Um, or health, for example. Let's take health for, for start off. I imagine this here is my waiting room. So you listen from learners. What's a waiting room? It's where you wait, clearly. What are you waiting for? To see the doctor. What's the place called where you go to see the doctor? It's a doctor's surgery or a clinic. Do you have surgery in a surgery? No, we have surgery in an operating theatre, but we go to see a doctor in a surgery, which is a bit odd, perhaps. Anyway, here's the first person who's waiting in the waiting room. So this is Bobby, and you ask your learner, so what's, what's his name? His name's Bobby, okay? Uh, now, Bobby's here because he's got a broken leg. Okay, so what's he got? He's got a broken leg. Um, his leg actually is already in plaster. So what do I mean by in plaster? Is it, has he got something on his leg? Yes. Is it What colour is it? White, maybe yellow. Is it hard or soft? Hard. Did he have it put on at the hospital? Yes. Okay. How long has he got to keep this on for? Six weeks, eight weeks. Okay. So we've got the idea of what in plaster means. So what is he? He's in plaster. Why? 
because he broke his leg. What's his name again? Bobby. Okay, so if you keep doing this kind of thing with the learners, back and forwards, repeating, so all about repetition. Essentially what you're doing is drilling this vocabulary. Okay, and then we'll have somebody else come into the surgery. Um, now this is um, Sally, and Sally's here because she's pregnant. Okay, she's pregnant. What is she? She's pregnant. All right, what's she going to have? A baby. Great, okay. Um, and you can obviously you know, use hand gestures to, to uh, make sure they understand what pregnant means. Okay, so she's here for an antenatal check. Why is she here? Antenatal check. Why? Because she's pregnant. And who's this person over here? Bobby. Okay, why, why is Bobby here? He's got a broken leg. And what's his leg? His leg's in plaster. Good, excellent. We add somebody else. Here's uh, a mother and she's come with her two children. As you can see, they are both the same age and they look the same, so they are twins. Yep, yeah, they're twins. All right, so she's got twins here. Um, unfortunately, they've got chicken pox. What have they got? Chicken pox. What's chicken pox? It's a disease. Do you usually have it when you're a child or an adult? Usually when you're a child. It's pretty bad if you have it when you're an adult. Um, do you get spots? Yes. Is it contagious? Yes, contagious. Does contagious mean that it's easy for other people to get this disease? Yes. Okay, so you're concept checking all the time. You're asking questions back and forward. Oh, and by the way, who's this one? Bobby. Right, and, and what, what about his leg? It's in plaster. So you've got this memorization task going on all the time. Let's add one more. This one looks remarkably like Sally, our pregnant Sally, but uh, in fact, it's Sally's sister. Okay, Sally's sister isn't pregnant, um, but uh, she's come along because, um, yeah, think of some other reason. So this way you've got several people, you've got quite a lot of vocabulary, related vocabulary, all about health and illness. Um, Sally's sister's come because she's a hypochondriac, that's always a nice one, um, for example. So you can then say to the learners, right, okay, in pairs, can you remember who all those people are? And having something visual there, it doesn't have to be the rods, it could be pictures, it could be, you know, board rubbers and pens, could be anything. But I think having something visual like that to hang on to really helps with people remembering things. So um, as they get learners to talk together in pairs, to remember what it was, you then need some kind of point at which you're going to write it down, give them the spelling. So again, you can elicit from them. Who's this one? It's Bobby. What's wrong with him? Broken leg. How do you spell broken leg? Write it up on the board. Hypochondriac. How do you spell that? Write it up on the board. So give them a written record of the vocabulary. Check again for, by now, the pronunciation you should have checked several times, so it should be fine. Um, at this point, you could get them to um, to, to role play, give them each one of those roles, they're Sally, they're Bobby, they're the mother, they're the twins, whatever, go and talk, do something very un-British, go and talk about your illness to the next person, oh, you know, what's wrong with you? Oh, I'm pregnant, I'm here for an antenatal check, and you, oh, I've got a broken leg, oh, how did you break your leg? Blah, blah, blah. So you can role play that again, this is all more gist, uh, grist for that meal of recycling the vocabulary. What you want is to get them to repeat it and repeat it as many times as you can. This will help them to remember. And then you could get them, for example, at the end, okay, sit down, we've rubbed it off the board or we've started a new whiteboard page, whatever. Um, can you remember all the words we've just learned? Get them to write it down, make it a competition. How fast can you write all those down in pairs, for example? Um, so this kind of thing, as I say, we, we took crime, it could be a prison, we could have Mac the Knife who's in for stabbing, murdering, we could have um, Cecil who's in for white collar crime, uh, he embezzled a lot of money, we've got um, somebody who's in for, I don't know, armed robbery. So again, it's an ideal opportunity there to have um, uh, that lexical set for crime. Um, I've used it before for adjectives of personality. So you've got several people there meeting at a dinner party, perhaps, um, and they have, you know, give them about three adjectives of personality each. So here's 
Bob and he's a bit arrogant. He's very confident, but actually a bit arrogant, a bit too confident. Um, but uh, he's also very um, entrepreneurial. So he's earned a lot of money in business, for example. So, you know, you describe these different people, get them to describe them to each other, discuss which one they'd like to meet or whatever. So again, there are all sorts of different things. It doesn't have to just be um, about, well, about anything really, couldn't it? But they, that works quite well, again, with lexical sets. Another thing to be thinking about is making sure that they record the vocabulary that they're learning properly. Um, I think it's really worth encouraging them to have some kind of vocabulary notebook. Thinking back to the last session that we did, you know, they, what do they need to know about this word? They need to know maybe it's translation into their language. They need to know what it means, maybe in English. They need to, you know, have some record of part of speech. Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Is it an adjective? All that kind of thing. Um, perhaps an example sentence, you know, so they've got an idea of how it's used. If it's got dependent prepositions, they need to know what they are. If it's got an irregular past tense, they need to know what that is. So thinking about those things, sometimes there won't be very much to record. Sometimes there'll be a lot. Um, but I think that ensuring that they record it properly, they've got some kind of effective way of recording it makes a big difference. Um, and also, of course, making sure that they go back and um, yeah, re 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 um, uh, review this. So what do they need to know? We've talked about this. So as I say, reviewing, uh, recycling is absolutely vital. Um, you're not going to remember something if you've learnt it once in class. That's the truth. Um, so it's really, really important that you spend time in class going back over words that you've learnt previously. Um, if they don't get the exposure, then you're going to have to make that exposure for them. So do think about this. Uh, one of the nicest ways of, of doing this is having a vocabulary box. Now, this could be a, a, a literally a box like this, or it could be just an envelope, just an A4 envelope or any, any kind of envelope. Um, I, I think it's always nice to have a box of some description. I usually have, you know, an actual box, uh, maybe a pretty box, uh, an old chocolate box or something. Um, in this box, I keep small slips of paper with the word on one side and actually in terms of for class that's all I have. If learners are doing it I'd encourage them to have on the other side the translation in their language. But you can have you know small pieces of, of paper in here, blank pieces, it doesn't take very long at the end of each lesson to write down the vocabulary that you've learnt in the lesson and this can go in the box. So then you have a really useful resource for recycling the vocabulary that's gone before. If you've got five minutes at the beginning of the lesson, you're waiting for people to arrive perhaps, if you've got five minutes at the end of the lesson, perhaps you know the lesson finished earlier than you thought, you want a quick, just in the middle of the lesson, you want a bit of a change of focus. This can be a very, very helpful warmer filler ender. Um, sort of activities that you could use with this. Um, you get a, blue, get a bit of blue tack, just stick up the words around the walls and literally just tell the people, right, go with a partner, go around the walls, can you remember what those mean? Simple as that. It's not, you know, rocket science, but again, it's just increasing their exposure to this language, repeating it. Getting them to group or categorise the words is a good thing to do. Um, again, there's research which suggests that if you do something meaningful with new vocabulary, you're more likely to remember it. So if you give groups of two or three several words from your vocabulary box, maybe give them half a dozen words each or maybe some more, these things mount up quite quickly, you could get them to put them all for example, just put them in alphabetical order. 
that might be a useful practice. You might get them to put them into groups of nouns, verbs, adjectives, for example. Um, you might get them to put them into different categories, lexical sets, for example. You could get them to just put them into different groups. These are words that I like. These are words that I don't like. These are words that I remember. These are words I don't remember. These are words I think I'll use. These are things, words I don't think I'll use, for example. You could get them to think of categories. Um, you know, think of a couple of categories and put your words in it. This is really, really helpful, I think, and a very useful thing, way to remember words. Um, put a couple up on a board, put three up on the board, put several up on the board, all of them, see how many, make it challenging for them. Put two very different words on the board and say, can you make a sentence that makes sense that contains both of these words? So again, you, something which is challenging, mentally challenging, um, and allows some real cognitive processing will help them to remember it. So that kind of thing is useful. Make a word search with them. Play Pictionary. Um, um, if, you, if you're not sure what Pictionary is, then you give one of the learners uh, one of the words and you tell them they've got to draw a picture of it on the board. Now, if that's a word like cat, that's fairly easy. If it's a word like arrogant, that's not so easy. Um, but you can get them to do this and, uh, and other learners have to have to guess. You could do it one learner in front of the class. You could do it competitively. One learner has the word and the others have to have to guess in different teams, for example. So anything like this, if we're really talking about just opportunities to recycle these words. Another thing is just giving them, giving them all two or three and telling them to describe those words to other people in the class and see if they can guess. So I've got my word, it's an adjective, it's describing somebody. This is someone who's very confident, too confident. It's a negative word. Arrogant, yes. Okay, so, you know, again, lots of very simple ideas to recycle this stuff. Um, discussions, role play. Again, you know, you can uh, get them to, to take some of the questions and make so it takes some of the vocabulary, make questions out of them. You know, do you like arrogant people, for example, or do you think there are any advantages to being arrogant, for example, um, and then get them to ask each other their questions. So anything, as I say, which is meaningful. The other thing that's really important, of course, is making sure that it's not just in the class that you really need to be looking at recycling vocabulary outside the class as well. Getting them to have a vocabulary book and you know recording things well will help, so that's certainly one way. There are a couple of great sites on the net for this as well. Um, Quizlet is one, Study Blue is another. Quizlet I particularly like um, and I'll show you that now. So this is Quizlet and um, this is uh, I've signed in here. Uh, you you do have to uh, sign in to make to make these flashcards, but it's free, so so that's really good. When you've done it, you can make flashcards very easily. So here's here's what I did earlier. Um, this is some vocabulary that my learners learned, and here I put in definitions. So you do have to write the vocabulary in the definition, but you can see that you can see. Both. The word was huge and my definition was very big. You can have both sides or you can click here so that you get the definition first and you have to remember what the word is. You get the definition first and you have to remember what the word is. You can have it so that you get the word first. Here's the word and I click for the definition. Clearly that's easier. You can also play games with it. So, for example, if I press this scatter, I can start the game here. Um, and someone who breaks into your house to steal things, for example, um, oh, I can't actually see it now, somewhere, uh, is a burglar. There we go. So we put a burglar in there together and they disappear. 
So formal to make money is generate income. So you can play a game that way and it'll time you as well. All right. So those are quite nice things to do. Uh, the other great thing about this, um, she said, back to set page, let's try that, is that it, you can enable the video, uh, sorry, enable audio. Now you can see here again, listen. Huge. Eye catching. So I didn't make those audio files, they're automatically generated, which is a really nice, uh, useful uh, thing for learners. When you've made these, you can print them, you can export them, you can copy them. So there's all sorts of you know, different ways that you can get them to your learners. And if you use this link or embed button here, you can you get some HTML code here, which means you can embed them on a website or a blog. And that's what I do with my class, is that I put these on the website every week for them on Moodle or whatever. You can put them up there so that they can use them. It's also possible to have these on a phone, so that's really useful. Um, Study Blue, which was the other, um, uh, this is the other program that I suggested. You can also use that. It has the same, the same kind of. It's the same kind of tool. Uh, with both of these, you can also put pictures on instead of definitions. So you can have a picture for lower levels. That might be quite useful. Um, they're both really nice tools and they're both free. So um, something I definitely recommend for recycling. Anyway, hopefully that's given you a few bits and pieces to think about when you're teaching vocabulary and it's been help helpful. Um, do come again next month and uh, happy Christmas. Thanks very much. Bye bye.